Hey, Richard Knudsen here again. Welcome to session two of my series on the new Polaris update for Dynamic CRM Online. If you haven't watched session one yet and need some background on things like what Polaris is and what I mean by the Flow UX, you should check it out. Otherwise, let's dive into session two. In part one of the series, I covered the basic user experience. The emphasis there was on on improvements to the UX in terms of personal productivity. In this session, I want to talk about something brand new and more about organizational productivity. The visual processes available on the Polaris forms for the case, lead, and opportunity entities. Now, one of the things I like best about this is that the Dynamic CRM team is finally putting a prescriptive stake in the ground around business processes. I mean, to most organizations, some record types really are process-centric. Cases, leads, and opportunities are the most obvious examples, but there are plenty of others. For example, from when you first create a new opportunity to when you close the deal, most of our organizations really do, or at least should, have certain things that happen in generally the same order. And we can say the same thing about lead qualification or case resolution processes. And although we CRM consultants have spent a lot of our time helping customers implement these processes, there's never really been anything on the default CRM forms that exposed or helped you visualize them. I think of the classic forms as essentially record-centric. And while that's appropriate for lots of record types, accounts and contacts, for example, it might not be when it's the process that matters. And that's what the new forms do they shift the focus from the record to the process, or from the static to the dynamic. These screenshots are the process sections at the top of the new case, and opportunity forms give you a glimpse of this. But let's dive in and take a closer look. So let's start with sales processes and take a look at the new opportunity form. I'll open an existing opportunity. Now, of course, the most obvious aspect of this form is how the sales process is exposed here, front and center, at the top of the form. This four-stage process you see here comes configured by default, but you can change it to fit your organization's sales process. And we'll look at that in a little bit. Now, the way this works is that each stage exposes the steps that should be taken before proceeding to the next stage. So by clicking through these stages, you can see the steps appropriate for each one. For example, on the proposed stage, you'll see steps like present proposal here. And if you click on the close stage, you can see steps like present final proposal. Now, a word on this terminology, and being careful to use the terms stages and steps, since that's how the system refers to these concepts. In a bit, I'll show you the new sales process editor, and you'll see what I mean. But now let's talk about how we move through the sales process. Notice I clicked on the close stage to check out its steps. But this little flag over here on the develop stage should give you a clue that we haven't changed the current stage. You can see that if I close the form and reopen it. We're still here on the develop stage. But to advance to the next stage, you just click on the next stage button. You see over here. And you can see now that the active stage flag gets updated. And this also tells us that these visual sales processes are not what we'd refer to as gated processes. There's nothing preventing me from advancing through a stage, regardless of whether the steps on the stage have been taken or not. And for that matter, there's nothing preventing me from closing a deal as one, even from the qualify stage. Now, that's not exactly what we think of as a best practice, but I like the way this default sales process has been implemented. It provides some guidance and makes the sales process central to the work that you do with deals, but it doesn't impose any constraints on how you work a deal or make them harder to work with. Now let's take a look at another aspect of this that's a big improvement over the default behavior of the classic forms. In Polaris, the sales stages exposed on the opportunity form are actually the ones that drive the sales pipeline chart. Now, I realize this might sound a little trite, but remember, on the default version of the old opportunity form, there is no field for the sales process. So unless you do some customizations, 
you can't even use the sales pipeline chart to visualize your pipeline. That's fixed in Polaris. I'll close out this form and work with the grid. Expanding the chart pane like this and then selecting the sales pipeline chart. And you can see that if I drill down on one of these sales stages by clicking on the chart component, like the proposed stage here, that the view is filtered to show only deals for that stage. And similarly, if I click on the develop stage like this, we see only deals that are at the develop stage of the pipeline. So if I open one of these up, and change the stage, for example, we'll advance it from develop to propose, and close out. You can pretty much see here that the pipeline chart reflects the change since that deal is no longer in the filter for the current stage. So if I remove the filter, refresh the chart, and then drill down on the proposed stage, you can see that the deal we changed has advanced here to the proposed stage. So again, this is out of the box, no customizations. Sales stage field exposed on the opportunity form is the same field that drives the sales pipeline chart. And we're going to take a closer look at that as we customize the sales process, which we'll look at now. Let's dig a little deeper now and take a look at how we can customize these sales processes. So I'm wearing my sales manager hat now, and like most organizations, mine has its own sales process. What I'll do is use the default process as a starting point, but modify it slightly, and I'll also add a new stage. Now I'm signed in as Rooster Knudsen, sales manager, and in case you're wondering, I'm also assigned the sales manager security role. So I'll create a new opportunity, and then I'll click this More Commands menu at the top of the form. Now notice I've got two commands here. Switch to Classic, come back to that later, and Edit Sales Process. I'll select Edit Sales Process, and we see the brand new Process Control Customization Tool in all its glory. Now remember, I've only got the Sales Manager Security role here. So this does not require a system administrator role to modify. Effectively, we're delegating out more customization capabilities to the business users. So the stages of our sales process are here on the left. Qualify, develop, propose, you see those. And the steps for each stage are in the next two columns. The middle column is the label that you'll see on the form. And the third column is where you tie it to a field in the database. You can see these are drop-down lists here. So let's make our changes. Changing the name of a stage is just typing. So I change develop to research. And while I'm at it, I'll delete these two steps from the new research stage. Now I want to add a new stage. So I'll click this Add New Stage button here, and I'll enter its name. This is the Needs Analysis stage. The Customization tool always puts new stages at the top, so what you can do is use these Move arrows to rearrange them. And we want our Needs Analysis stage to go after the research stage and before the proposed stage, like this. Now, I'll add some steps for the needs analysis stage. And what I'll do is add the two steps I just removed from the research stage, like this. First, I'll add the customer needs step. And I can get it just by typing. It filters down the list, so there's customer need. And I'll give it the same label. And add another step. So it's proposed solution. Enter the label. And then I'll add a new step for this stage. And I'll use a field called confirm interest.
for this one. And give it the same label. And then all I need to do is rearrange the order of these so that they're presented visually in the order that we need. So I'll move the uh, proposed solution to the end. Start with confirm interest. Then I did identify the specifics of the customer need and then start working on the proposed solution. So the steps of my needs analysis stage. Then I'm pretty much done. I click OK and it tells me that it's publishing the new process and we can see that the needs analysis stage has been inserted there between the new research and then the proposed stage. If I close out and then reopen a new opportunity, qualify stage, research, notice now only two steps in the research stage, and here's my needs analysis stage, the new stage with confirm interest, customer need, proposed solution. And by the way, notice that these text fields here give you the same inline experience I emphasized in session one. So you can see how much easier it makes the editing experience as I enter some text appropriate for these fields. Then I can go ahead and close out of the opportunity form. Remember, autosave will make sure we don't lose anything. And that's pretty much it for session two. We've seen how to work with the new visual sales process on the opportunity form and how easy it is for a non-technical user to customize it. Now in the next session on the Polaris user experience, session three, I'll drill down a little further on some customizing tips and tricks and we'll take a look at how we can switch back and forth between the, the so-called flow UX, the new forms, and the classic forms. But then as I mentioned in session one, I'll also discuss some of the things to watch out for in the Polaris UX, and I'll provide some guidance on why you should, or in some cases should not, roll out the new user experience to your users. Richard Knudsen again, signing off, and I hope you found this helpful.